This is Alex Mozed, and we are on Winner Take All, where we talk about all things tech, monopolies, regulation, and uh, today is August 1st. Let's jump on in. So there's a lot that's occurred over the past couple of weeks, particularly it's earnings season these past couple of weeks. And so one of the things that we've seen is just the dominance of platform business models uh, as it relates to the overall indices that are out there. And what we've seen, if we look at the S&P 500 here, um, there's an article from the Wall Street Journal that says there's a tech rally powers record gains for stocks. Together, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook have accounted for 19% of the S&P 500's total return this year. So four companies uh, have account, all platforms, all in plat have accounted for almost 20% of the S&P 500's returns, which is comprised of, if you didn't know, 500 different companies, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but this is actually just the tip of the iceberg. So if we dig down really deeper into this concept of just how dominant platforms are, um, actually many years ago, we predicted, we wrote an article in, what is this, 2015, that in, in 25 years, 50% of the S&P 500's net income will come from platforms. Oh, so that was in 25 years. So that would be, uh, we, we've got you know another 22 years or so to go, 21 years. But the other thing that we were saying is in 2020, 5% of the S&P 500 uh, will be platform businesses based on our projection. And this was in the book, Modern Monopolies, um, based on our projection of how many platform companies would be predicted to go public, and then some portion of those would be included in the S&P 500. So we've actually done that analysis. And so what we found is that of the 70 public platform stocks in Platt, um, 21 of them are in the S&P 500. So we were, you know, four companies away from, from hitting that yep. 5% prediction. Um, and I think we've got a very nice pipeline of, of platform companies that have gone public in the past, you know, this year and the year prior. I think they need like a couple of years to yeah. be public before they can be included in the S&P 500. Seems like there's, a, I'd say, at least half a dozen companies or so that are, are going to be up for that within the next couple of years. So it certainly would be uh, surpassing that threshold soon. And Market Access just joined the S&P 500 or is just about to join the S&P 500. Market Access, if you don't know, it's basically an investment platform. It's a marketplace to trade bonds and other types of fixed income instruments. It's a very cool business, something that we really didn't know about prior to having you know, built up the Platform Insights data product that, that Wisdom Tree ended up licen licensing. But in doing that research and building the profile of public platforms, Market Access is a very cool business, very dominant business, definitely has a winner take all dynamic. Yeah, um, pretty cool. That they, emer they emerged out of the, uh, really started to grow after the financial crisis when a lot of banks moved away from some of that activity and they really needed this secondary liquidity pool for uh, you know, bonds, fixed, in fixed income products and that kind of stuff. And they really have grown to dominate that space. And what we published uh, on our blog at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019 is, this is before Platt came out, obviously, but we were doing a preliminary analysis of the 50 platform companies or so public that we had um, comprised at that point and looked at their performance in 2018. So in 2018, it was a bad year, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, New York Stock Exchange was down about 12%, NASDAQ about 5%, Dow um, 6%, S&P 500 about 7%. And so what we found with the roughly 50, 50 companies at that point in time is they were down about one and a half percent, one point four percent over the course of 2018. So what we saw is that um, the platform businesses will decline less when there is a downturn. And then when the stocks bounce back, the platforms bounce back faster, which is kind of the holy grail of what many investors are looking at. And so Although Platt has only been out now for a little more than two months, um, May 22nd, it came out of 2019. If we're just looking at, you know, if you'd put $10,000 in on May 22nd, right now you'd have earned 730 bucks on that. So about 7.3% return in, you know, in about nine weeks. 
Um, which if then we start to benchmark that against the rest of the market and the S and P 500, the Dow Jones, other tech indices, now you just start to really see how dominant this is, even though, you know, if you look at, um, like value investors have been hammered, yeah. uh, recently where all the value investors, um, you know, are, 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 are trying to stay positive in this environment and say, well, you know, <laughs> our time will still come. And so if people don't know what value investing is, value investing is basically when you invest in a company because you believe that there are undervalued assets, right? There's intrinsic value in a business that the market just isn't valuing properly. They're not recognizing um, that value appropriately. And you have a hypothesis on what that is. And um, you're now investing in that usually over the mid to long term until the market can appropriately price that value in. Value investors historically over the past 10 years have vastly underperformed against the other class of investors, which would be growth investors. Growth investors are typically the ones that are investing in, in companies, certainly tech companies, some platform companies, but it could also just be more traditional businesses that are reinvesting a lot of their earnings into growth. Um, if you were to compare just broadly value to growth, growth investors have bested value investors by a wide margin over the past 10 years. Value investors have said, well, you know, we don't think that these things are going to continue over the next 10 years and the next 10 years will be our time to shine. Well, um, they've really been killed over the past few months that that the market in general has performed pretty well. So even though Platt's up 7.3, 7.5%, the rest of the market's also doing pretty decently as well. well. Let's talk about value investing in platforms too. I think part of the challenge there, that these are very different business models. They're asset light. Uh, a lot of the value of that business actually is off the balance sheet in terms of that network that they create. And that's difficult, I think, for many value investors to appropriately value that piece of it, that ecosystem and that network effect and that kind of traditional analysis. So I think that's also part of why a lot of these folks might not be uh, invested in a lot of these platform companies. Yeah. And, you know, we'll see how um, how that starts to change with some of the stuff we're working on or, over the next few years. But um, so one of the platform companies that did that did not actually outperform, although it has in the past, is Amazon. Um, we have talked about how we think Amazon has a lot of great opportunity, probably amongst the platform tech monopolies, probably has the most opportunity in, in front of it. Um, but one one portion of Amazon that we haven't really talked much about is Twitch. If you remember a few years ago, Amazon bought Twitch for a billion dollars and it's live, it's a live streaming content platform. Um, it really cornered the market for letting gamers live stream playing video games and, and build a following. Um, in the past, probably 18 months or so, it's really taken off with the likes of Ninja and Fortnite and these, um, Gamers have really built huge profiles to the tunes of millions and millions and millions of followers. I think Ninja was reportedly making um, last year half a million dollars a month in ad revenue. So ad revenue that Twitch is basically bringing to Ninja off of people watching the live stream or subscribing to his stream. And now it's certainly got to be over a million dollars a month uh, in terms of the, the earnings that these folks are making. But what share of the market does Twitch have for that today? So that was the interesting thing. This Forbes article that just came out it says Amazon, Amazon owned Twitch has three quarters of the market. So 75% wow. of the live streaming market <laughs> is on Twitch, which is astounding. I mean, and YouTube, li YouTube live attracted less than 20% of the 3.77 billion hours watched live. Wow. Facebook gaming. Never even really heard of that. Um, and Microsoft's own Mixer grabbed the rest of it. So um, Twitch had 2.72 billion hours watched uh, over this period of time, which I think was maybe this past quarter. Twitch's story is interesting, too, because they really cornered the market on gaming live streaming, which was gaming content was something that was a huge growth area for YouTube early on. But Twitch has really kind of taken over that over the last few years, particularly in the live streaming department. YouTube has obviously tried to get into the gaming live streaming, but they just really haven't made much of a dent, certainly compared to Twitch. It's interesting. And, and I think, you know, 
the the best use case for the live streaming was gaming. Right. They cornered that market, and now Twitch is really starting to expand into a variety of other arenas. Um, interestingly have- enough, we are live streaming this on YouTube, um, <laughs> but and not Twitch, which uh, which is interesting. But LinkedIn has live streaming. Twitter has live streaming. Um, LinkedIn's is more gated. So you know, I think people are getting into the live streaming place space. Um, but yeah, I think going head to head with Twitch to try and capture the gaming market, it's not going to work. It's tough. You've got to find, you've got to find your own niche that you can go after. Uh, if LinkedIn can get stuff in the business space yes. and do very well there, for example, that could be a niche they would build up. Might not be as big as gaming, but it right. would certainly give them something that they could defend. Yeah. Whereas Agreed. if they just try to go head to head with Twitch, they're going to get killed. Exactly. You know, play to your strengths on the theme of Amazon, Amazon beat on a revenue basis last week when they announced earnings, but they did not beat on earnings. Um, the reason why is that o- over the past few months, they started to announce a big push across millions yep. of SKUs that they are going to be now delivering one day delivery. Um, and that's expensive. And that that's really the the main reason that they didn't beat on the earnings was they said, hey, we're going to push into one day delivery. I think partially um they you know they probably definitely had pan- plans to move into one day delivery i bet the stuff from walmart and rakuten's trying to come into the u.s we're starting to see specialized marketplaces ebay just announced a fulfillment offering alibaba moving into um, b2b in the u.s yeah there's just a lot more players trying to get into e-commerce marketplaces yep. in the u.s and so i bet they moved up these plans to have one day delivery. I mean, delivery has been the killer app for Amazon for many, many years, right? If we think about the iPhone has maybe five or 10 killer apps on it, right? That that need to be core to the service um, in order for the, the value prop of the phone to resonate. Um, this would be the killer app for Amazon, which is delivery. And um, that has been a huge investment that they've made. We've We've cataloged uh, now, the majority of the fulfillment and the shipments on Amazon uh, are actually being fulfilled by Amazon itself. Amazon's fulfilling the majority right, of meaning, their orders. Meaning they're going end to end on that and not, for example, outsourcing it out to the last mile to UPS, UPS or, or someone. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, but now this, this is expensive. It put up their cost 21%. You can see how expensive that is. Walmart tried to match this, but I think they only matched it on maybe a few, few hundred skews, thousand yeah. SKUs, which is maybe 10%. Of what Amazon has been doing. So why is that expensive? Explain that. What are they building out here? That what are they investing in that costs so much money? I so I think it's a lot of infrastructure expense. Just I mean, um, so warehouses. That's warehouses. Shipping vehicles. That's all the all the um, technology and equipment and infrastructure that goes into a warehouse. These warehouses are automated. They're massive, um, and and each one of them is expensive. I think. Um, I th- I think Amazon has close to a hundred fulfillment centers across the United right. States. Compared Walmart, to what about twenty for Walmart? Walmart right? has about twenty, yeah. and and again, as we've been talking about on previous episodes, um, that's what wa- that that's what really has been hurting Walmart is they're spending a billion dollars, they're losing a billion dollars a year. That means they're spending more than a billion dollars a year on infrastructure, but they're right. losing a billion dollars a year on their e-commerce net, net on e-commerce yep. because of the infrastructure investments that they need to make. And as we've said. That's the right decision for Walmart to be making. And basically what you're seeing is Walmart was getting some flack for that. Amazon just doubled down and said, OK, well, yeah, Walmart's getting flack for for losing a billion dollars on e-com. Well, I'm going to double down and have and, and incru- in- increase my cost profile by 20 percent um, to invest in one day delivery. Now, here's the other interesting thing. What they also said is that. Um, revenue rose 20%. And analysts expected there to be a 17% rate of growth. So what they're saying is that they see a correlation between um, between having one day delivery. Right, that infrastructure investment and revenue growth. And, um, and then the corresponding increase in demand, basically. Yep. And that consumers want it. They like the one day delivery. So Amazon's going to chase that. Now, um, I think on episode four or five, we were talking about how FedEx had dropped um, 
had, had dropped Amazon as a customer. Yep. Uh, Amazon was only fulfilling like one, one and a half percent of its orders through FedEx. I think it was Amazon was one or two, per, like one and a half percent of FedEx's business. Of FedEx's Something business. Something to that effect. It was both small for both companies. Right. But now leading up to that in, in FedEx's earnings release, they officially, it, it officially cited Amazon as a competitor for the first time. Yep. Uh, in their 10K. So you can now start to see this. And what we had also said in that episode is that UPS should drop Amazon. Now that would be a much bigger, um, a much bigger move for UPS. It certainly accounts for much more than the one or two points that it did for FedEx. But if FedEx is recognizing Amazon as a competitor, Amazon's definitely a competitor to UPS too. These are basically the same businesses. Yeah, I, I think that they definitely know that. I think the challenge is how do you transition from kind of being frenemies with Amazon to actually figuring out how you compete with them? Because uh, Amazon certainly is, is starting to figure out they're not going to take over all of the stuff that a UPS or FedEx does today, but they're going to take all the parts that you know make the most margin or for them create the most costs and leave you with the commoditized stuff that you're not going to make any money on. So it's a, it's a tough position to be in. Yeah, it, it it is tough, but wouldn't help. I mean, yeah, it's it's just a matter of how much are you helping the enemy while making short term right. income. And I don't really know if the Amazon revenue is material enough to UPS that it's helping UPS build out additional infrastructure or investments. You know, it's kind of like subsidizing UPS's infrastructure network. I don't think it's that material to UPS that. And obviously, Amazon's actually been decreasing the amount of packages on UPS anyway. So I don't know how much you're, if you're a UPS, how much investment are you actually going to make in your infrastructure based on some projection of future revenue coming from the Amazon customer? I don't think you can actually provide much uh, value to that business line item anyway. But, you know, we'll just see how hard these, uh, these logistics players want to make it for Amazon. On the topic of Amazon, you know, we've talked a lot about the dynamic of regulation versus legislation. And some people have asked us, well, what's the difference? So what is the difference between regulation and legislation? And so to break this down, legislation would be when you pass a law. That would be when Congress um, puts a bill into the House and then into the Senate. And then the president signs that. And this bill becomes a law. When you create a law and you actually have legislation that comes to the floor of Congress, what that's doing is putting broad based rules um, and then some corresponding possible penalties if those rules are broken. And then that gets passed as a law um, on, a, on, a, on a federal basis. You know, same thing could happen on a, on a statewide basis. But what we saw, say, with GDPR in the EU or what we've seen with the 1996 uh, law, the kind of Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is what gives these platforms a lot of safe harbor. If if infringing content on YouTube is posted to YouTube, YouTube can't get sued because that content was infringing on IP law. YouTube needs to take best practices to remove the content if someone notifies them that, that it does violate IP um, rights. But YouTube can't necessarily be held res- liable for violating IP rights of someone else. And, and so that was the DMCA law that was passed, I think, in 1996. Now, what you see with these laws is they're pretty broad. They're not going to be specifically focused on one company um, or, or um, you know, specifically on, say, product marketplaces or content platforms. And now regulation is different in the sense that the regulators would be, for example, the FTC, the uh, in the United States, in which the FTC is now investigating multiple of these tech monopolies. Um, the FTC is really the one that that settled with uh, Facebook on the privacy uh, violations for $5 billion a couple of weeks ago. And when we say regulation is a better way to handle tech monopoly anti-competitive practices than legislation, what that's saying is empower regulators. Empower regulators like the FTC. And why is that? Because what the FTC can do through regulation is they can say, here are the regulations for Amazon. And they can make it very specific. They can make it very specific on a specific company. They can make it very specific on a certain industry 
or say product marketplaces versus legislation is going to be much more broad sweeping. Uh, we saw this from Elizabeth Warren, who was saying that we should have just broad sweeping legislation that if you make more than, I don't know, $20 billion in revenue, then you're considered a monopoly and, and certain, you know, the, rules the analogy I would use here is the, the legislation is what sets the rules of the game. The regulation is the referees actually interpreting and enforcing that. So they're the ones that are on the ground uh, actually making these decisions, you know, what's a foul, what's not, that kind of stuff. Uh, so that they're actually the ones interpreting and enforcing those rules. And and the regulators have the authority to um, act on a lot of, you know, a lot of these transgressions. So the privacy violations from the Facebooks of the world, they didn't need new legislation to go after uh, Facebook and, and find them and all these kinds of things. So the regulators already have a lot of power. What the regulators haven't done is really waded into the waters of looking at anti-competitive practices, again, on the producer. And that's what the EU just did a couple of weeks ago with Miss Vestager, um, saying that we're going to look into Amazon and how Amazon uses data from third party sellers in its marketplace and whether it's using that data inappropriately to compete in an unfair manner. And that is where, again, regulation could be provided to say if you are a dominant product marketplace like Amazon and you can have certain uh, certain thresholds that could be passed. Um, to qualify as a dominant or monopoly status marketplace or platform business, then here are the types of rules that you have to comply to according to the regulator, the FTC. Same thing could be done for a Facebook, um, a YouTube, a Google, a Twitter. When you have this monopoly status, winner-take-all positioning in a market, what is appropriate, and this was what Zuckerberg has literally asked for um, just uh, in June, to be regulated about what is appropriate to take down content that might be harmful or abusive versus where is that a violation of free speech? And right now, Facebook has tried to come up with its own rules on where those lines are, and it's very hard to get those rules correct. And, and that is really the role of a regulator of the government is to come in and help provide guidance about what is fair and what is inappropriate. Be the referee. Exactly. Um, so that would be the big difference. And the regulation is specific. The referees can provide. It's like trying to be a referee and provide rules because one team is playing football and the other team is playing basketball. Right. And I'm going to pass rules that are going to apply to both games. And then magically these rules are going to work. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't work that way, right? I mean, well, where you need legislation is if the regulators did not have the legal authority to pursue certain actions that they needed. I uh, don't think that's necessarily the case right now. And, you know, if there's a case to be made that, okay, the FTC or the Department of Justice does not have the authority to go after something, that's when you would say, all right, we need legislation to enable that. But it doesn't seem like we're there now because obviously they are looking at these companies, they are figuring out how to regulate them. There's a lot of actions in place. It's just they haven't done that until really this year. Right. And, and, and I mean, that stuff is just getting started. But again, you know, it's just unfortunate that the EU is starting to take the lead on these things. And it just seems like the, the DOJ, the Department of Justice and the FTC, from what we've been hearing, are more so just continued to focus on privacy as opposed to really right. looking at who are the producers, who are the sellers, who are the content creators, and how are these platforms competing unfairly in that arena? Right. Um, Google copying people's content on Google search and then favoring their own content, which is really just ripped content from a Yelp, a TripAdvisor or lyrics. Yeah, there was uh, a genius is accusing Google of basically ripping their lyrics and they had particular uh, you know, ways that they posted things with you know, quotations that they used in the in them that basically created like a, a kind of digital watermark to show this had come from their content. And that it turned out that a lot of the stuff Google was putting in its snippets uh, what was supposedly quote unquote Google content was actually stuff that had just been ripped from genius and they got caught kind of red handed doing that. Mm hmm. Exactly. So um, that's it for for this portion of winner take all. Uh, we will be back soon and and uh, keep going with our tech analysis. Thank you.